morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning an hour early. That means we get out an hour later. Is that not what that means? No, okay. It's great to see you here this morning. Would you stand with me? Let me pray with you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, such a lovely day. Thank you for our time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, just providing and blessing us each day with your presence. Father, I pray that you would guide us today, that our worship and praise would be acceptable in your sight, and that uh, as we leave this building today, that we would go out and serve and minister to others and disciple others, lead them to you as the Holy Spirit it does, uh, does all the transforming and uh, the convicting. Uh, we just present the gospel and we carry the message. Father, thank you for this this time. May you be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Remain standing and let's sing. Blessed be your name. Yeah. 
Most of the people out on the streets either have mental illness or they have an addiction. I just went over that and ended up getting heavy into some drugs. And I lost my job. I became homeless. I was constantly heat exhaustion, alcohol poisoning. But I can literally say I was dying. Somehow my parents got a hold of Caddy, and that's what opened up the door for me to become sober. I met Yvonne, and she was homeless on the street, came to Friendship House, and things began to change in her life. Baptist Friendship House is a ministry center to folks that are impoverished, to folks that are unhoused, and to human trafficking survivors. We're able to provide them a meal. We're also able to meet those basic physical needs that, that others may have. It opens the door to minister to the spiritual needs so that a life-changing relationship can begin with Jesus Christ. We have a creative arts time, and usually that's pottery. They'll begin to open up and start sharing things during that time. When you sit there and you have a clay in your hand, you know what you're going to be doing with it and what's going to become of it. But the clay doesn't know what's going to have to go through to get to it. Sometimes our lives are broken, and we're like just a big old lump of clay. And so lives can be molded and shaped by Jesus to be able to accomplish his perfect will. I have never seen a life change like a bond's. And it's just been amazing to watch God work in her life and then see how he's using her now in our ministry. I never would have thought that I would be where I am today because I have no hope. This place is my home. When you give to Andy Armstrong, you have to make my ministry possible. Jesus never gives up on you, and so we should never give up on anybody else. That's a good message. Yeah. Uh, I want you to see that because in your bulletin, if you'll note there, you have a prayer guide that starts this week. And um, the, the uh, missionary that you saw there, Kate Bennett, is our first person to pray for. Annie Armstrong Easter offering is about North American missions, and that uh, encompasses quite a lot of different ministries and missions. We're going to start uh, giving to that today, and we're going to continue on. What is our goal? We have a goal. I can't remember at the moment. 15. 15. 15. 15. Then 1,500. That's our goal. So keep that in mind, and uh, for the next uh, few weeks, uh, you'll hear more about this and have opportunity to give more. There are specific envelopes for that, um, Andy Armstrong Easter offering. If you just put it in a plain envelope, just note that it's for Andy Armstrong so that the money counting team will understand what that's for. Make sure you take a look at all the things in your bulletin, all the upcoming uh, events and Bible study uh, opportunities, uh, different classes, um, uh, different things going on. So also there's a women's Bible study uh, group that's meeting uh, starting on the 20th. And that's a brand new thing, so keep that in mind. As well as uh, other things, opportunities to serve, and those on our back to on the back of the bulletin to pray for. If you if you receive the mass announcement, and again, if you if you do not, uh, there are forms back here on this table. They will be bulletin for several weeks. Uh, so you can sign up to make sure you get that mass announcement. That is our best way to communicate to you about what's going on. Terry Lilly's had quite a week, he and Rhonda, and I've given you several updates there. He's still at Grand Strand, and uh, he's doing, doing okay, considering what he's been through. But uh, they say the next uh, 24, 36 hours or somewhat, in that, somewhere in that range, the antibiotics should start doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but he's had... Several surgeries this week and had a lot of highs and lows, and lows as well as Rhonda. So continue to keep them in your prayers. Ms. Laura's having a uh, procedure this Tuesday, right? On your birthday. That's what happens on your birthday. You get to the doctor. So I uh, pray for Laura there and several others. All those on our list, all those who have lost loved ones recently, we want to continue to pray for those. And uh, any other announcement that's in there, please note all the things going on. Next. Yes, ma'am. It's good to see Bob Bell here today. It is, Brother Bob. Where is Bob? I saw him earlier. Hey, Brother Bob. We've been praying for you. Well, we're glad you were back. We didn't know where you had gone. And we were a little worried about the rapture had happened. But we were still here, so but we're glad you're back. Uh, it's good to see you. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, we were praying for Bob. Bob is on mission 24-7.
And uh, if you want to learn about missions or evangelism or making disciples, talk to Bob. Um, appreciate him being here this morning. I, I need some children to help me. And so if you've got any children or children at heart, would you? My dog would have no kids. What'd you say? I said, my dog would have got no kids. She doesn't. There's one on the way. There's one on the way. Sometimes let's just set this for seven feet. Okay, Brady. I don't know exactly how tall you are, buddy, but the requirement today is seven feet. There we go. It's right here. Seven feet. Okay. You got to be over seven feet to be loved by God. Okay. The way we're going to reach this, he's going to have to jump really high. Okay. Or maybe we can reach that by works. Maybe you can do some jobs around the house, mow the grass, <laughs> eat ice cream. Can you do that? Eat ice cream? Be a big brother? Can you be a big brother? Yes. Okay. Well, the problem a lot of times in our lives is we see this. We're, we're about that tall. We're full of energy. Okay. And, uh, God's requirement seems to be up there somewhere, seven feet. But the cool thing, can you help, can you help up on that, buddy? Can you hold this? Can you hold that for me? Can you hold the orange chain at the bottom? It's a bottom. Can you get that? You got it? Uh-oh. Here, hold this. We follow him, we yield, we submit. 
ourselves and our lives to Him. He is Lord. It's a huge statement. Would you stand with me? Let's sing this together.
rough. I, I worked outside of Cabana Terrace Hotel there in North Myrtle Beach and gave rides all summer long, and I just loved it. It was a great job. But at the end of every season, I had to turn the boat upside down because it wore out on the sand. And the fiberglass hulls would eventually have holes worn in them because the sand over time will cut through just about anything. So I was pulling the boat up on the sand and pushing it out to get rides and pulling it in and pushing it out. And by the end of the season, I turned it over. And that hole that supposedly looked like this was flat on the bottom. And instead of yellow, it was a little pale, almost clear, because it was wearing through. So inevitably, I would have to put some two-sided tape or some of the special tape all the way down the pontoons on both sides. And I would go to Village Surf Shop in Garden City, some of you may know where that is, and I would ask uh, Kelly down there for some, for some resin and catalyst. And he would give me this jug, and I had some, some coloring, because I wanted the pontoons to be yellow, of course. So I had to mix the coloring in there and the resin, and I would, I would mix it up. Now what would happen if I took that resin, and I mixed it with the coloring, and I poured it in that channel, with that tape, but I didn't add any catalyst. It would harden, just be liquid, and it would just make a mess. The more catalyst you added to it, the quicker it would set up. And there was a, there was a certain amount you had to put in it. You had to work with it a little bit, but I would, it was just drops. The catalyst was in a little vial. The resin was in a gallon jug. Just a little bit of catalyst is all it took. A couple drops. Mix it up, pour it in that channel, and after a while, it started getting solid and it started getting hard. And you're pushing it out and then working with it, after a while, it was hard as a rock. I took the tape off and it stood the test of time there, and I'd sand it down and it'd be good to go for another season. Because the catalyst made the resin work like it was supposed to. It applied something to that resin to, to make it do what it was supposed to do. Catalyst for you and for me is faith. The work has already been done. Jesus Christ did the work on Calvary. The catalyst for us is the faith. We must apply the faith. Just a little bit of faith. Faith of the mustard seed moves mountains. A little bit of faith. Faith is the key. Faith is the victory. Without faith, you and I are doomed. With faith, we have this connection with God. We're a part of the family of God. I want you to go to Romans chapter 3. We've been walking through this slowly, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, Romans chapter 3, and um, we're just on a couple verses here, 27 through 31, at the very end of this chapter. Paul has been talking, uh, for the first three chapters basically, uh, he's been talking about justification, and a lack of justification, and what it's in, and what it's not in, he talks here that all the world is guilty, and he's dealing with some Jewish folks that feel like, hey, I'm almost up to that seven-foot mark. Matter of fact, I'm pretty close to God's standard. This is why, for the Jews, we've been sacrificing the animals, we've been praying, we've been going to the priests, we've been walking the steps we're supposed to walk, no more, no less, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, we've been observing the Sabbath, eating only kosher foods. We have a list of things that make us pretty tall. And then Paul has an audience there of Gentiles as well, and they're saying, wait a minute, we, we can't even get off the ground here. We, we didn't know about the sacrifice. We, we haven't offered any animals, and, and we don't eat kosher. We like our pork chops. And, and, and there's a lot of things, and they said, you know, how can we meet up the standard the, like the Jews? They're, they're up there, and, and we, we can't even get off the ground. So that's what Paul's dealing with. And he says here in verse 27, Where then is the boasting? It's excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No. But by a law of faith. Of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. For is God the God of Jews only? Hmm? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes. Of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. Same God. There's only one God. 
Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. What's Paul saying? He asked five questions here. I don't know if we'll get all five of them today, but there's five questions. The first one is, where then is the boasting? He says that in the very first sentence, where then is the boasting? Because the Jews had been bragging. They were pretty arrogant about their status with God. I'm not going to ask you to show your hand, but I'm just going to ask you, have you ever felt that way based on your performance? I'm, I'm closer to God's standard because I have a perfect attendance in the church service. I'm teaching Sunday school. I'm preaching the, the, the sermons. I'm leading the music. I'm, I'm doing whatever. I'm serving. I'm going to the shepherd's table. I'm going to see David. I'm doing things. So I'm getting higher. Okay? Have you ever felt that way? Then there's the other side of that coin. Have you ever felt like I can't even get off the ground here because I know about it. And I look at all these other folks and they're doing all these wonderful things and they have to be closer to God because of their, their resume, what they're doing. And he says, where there is boasting, where then is the boasting? And he says this, it's excluded. It is excluded. I love this word here in the Greek. That word means to shut out, out of doors. In other words, kicked out the front door. Okay? I love that example. I can, I can see that in my head. Where's the boasting? Somebody kicked it outside. That's exactly what the word means. There's no room for boasting in this house. It's kicked out the door. Why? Because it's about Christ. And it's about placing our faith in Him. It's not about my merit. You should be able to rest in that, folks. I certainly can. But there are days that Steve Cashin is a total failure. I know that comes as a shock. But my wife back there is raising her hand and raising her hand. It's just it's a total failure. And there are times, there are days when I think, I need good. But it depends on which day you ask. Well, who you ask. Or who you ask. Good point, Brian. That's right. Depends on who you ask. But you know what? You and I don't have to wonder from day to day where our status is with God. Because it's in Jesus Christ and it's in our faith with Him. And He does the work. He does the redemption. He does the buying. His blood shed, purified, cleansed, forgiven. It's in Him. Yes, you're going to have some bad days. There's going to be some days that we're so arrogant we can't stand ourselves. Amen. Now, you talk about your spouse now or your family. Us. And there's going to be days that we say, I really feel like I was pleasing to God today, and that is a good thing. But I want you to know that your status in God has changed. Your faith in Jesus is the key. It's the catalyst. Your faith, your ongoing faith in Christ. So he said, boasting has been kicked out the front door. It's been excluded. The microphone fell off. Okay. I thought something, something was going on right here. I don't know for sure. But what kind of law works? His second question is, on what principle? The principle of faith. On what principle? It's on faith. It's not on pedigree. It's not on the Jews being Jews. And it's not against the Gentiles being Gentiles. It's based on faith. And that's the same for you and for me. The third question he says is, is God the God of Jews only? What's the answer? Aren't you glad? Now, I don't know your background, but I don't think all of us are Jews in here. Um, we don't have Jewish background. Some, some may. The question is asked, of what makes a, a person a Jew? Is it, is it nationality? Is it ethnicity? Is it religion? But my understanding is it started from Abraham, so it's a family. Um, yeah. So if you're not part of Abraham's family, then you're in trouble. So am I. Uh, unless he's also the God of the Gentile. And the answer, uh, obviously, is he is. It's God, the God of Jews only. Because at this particular time, in this particular meeting, in this place here in Rome, the church, the Jewish church, saw that they had some kind of special treatment from God and they had a, a reason for God to like them because they were His chosen people. They are His chosen people. But they also thought that it was exclusive and it's not exclusive. Paul had to remind them of that. God is not just the God of Jews. He's God of Gentiles as well. And the Jews had to deal with this because they knew from what the Scripture said in the Old Testament there's only one God. Yahweh is one. So if he's also a God of the Gentiles, he's the same God. It can't be two different gods. The fourth question is, is God also the God of Gentiles? 
Everyone else. Is he also your God and my God? He is. He absolutely is. The fifth question he says here is, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Do we just do away with it? And by the way, the law in this passage, sometimes it's talking about the Pentateuch, the law, the first five books. And sometimes it's talking about the whole of the Old Testament. And that's what it means right here. Does this do away with the whole Old Testament? No. Matter of fact, in the next chapter, chapter 4, Paul is going to focus on David and Abraham. They were justified by faith. Not by the law. Abraham lived 400 years before the law was ever written. And it says very clearly in the scripture that they were justified by faith, not by the law. So they could be Old Testament characters and still be justified by faith. We'll see that in the next chapter as we delve into that a little bit deeper. I want to read here a little bit from J. Vernon McGee. And I want you to hear his words as he has a very unique way of describing this passage. He says, if God is saving by faith in Christ and not by merit, your works, then where's boasting? What is it that you and I have to crow about? Not one thing. We can't even boast of the fact that we're fundamental in doctrine. We have nothing to glory in today. Paul asks, where is boasting then? He answers the question he raises. It is excluded. By what law? Of works. Nay, but by the law of faith. The word law in the first instance is not restricted to the Old Testament law. It means the principle of law, any law, and anything that you think you can do. The second reference to law excludes the Old Testament law. It means simply a rule or principle of faith. In other words, God has the human race not on the merit system, but on the basis of simply believing what he has done for us. Therefore, it excludes boasting. You say, well, I'm a self-made person. Really, did you breathe any time during that? Where did that oxygen come from? Where did those lungs come from? Amen. God created. He provides every day. Do you need food in that time you were a self-made person? Who provided that? Who grew all that? Who, who created all that? God. He goes on further to say, when it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. This is not a conclusion that Paul is coming to or even a summing up of what he has said. Rather, he is giving an explanation of why boasting is excluded. He's kicked out the door. Why is boasting ex excluded? Man is justified by faith. Now Paul not only drives the nail in, he turns the board over and clinches it. Listen to him. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. In other words, does God belong to the Jews alone and not also to the Gentiles? Paul says yes to the Gentiles also. Now listen to this. This is a very cogent argument. Paul says, if justification is by the law then God does belong to the Jews. But if justification is by faith, then he is the God of both Jews and Gentiles. And that is something you and I ought to be thankful for. The last thing I'll read to you here from him, it says, The reference to the law, I think, brings in another meaning of this word. It is not restricted to the Mosaic system here, neither does it refer to just any law. Rather, it refers to the entire Old Testament revelation. Faith excluded the works of the law. But did it abrogate the entire Old Testament revelation? Of course not. Paul will demonstrate in the next chapter. I mentioned to you about Abraham and about David. And he concludes with this. He says, Today, my friend, when you and I will take the position that we're sinners and come to God and trust Christ as their Savior, regardless of who we are, where we are, how we are, or when we are, God will save us. For God today has put man on one basis and one basis alone. His question is, what will you do with my son who died for you on the cross? What will you do with Jesus? You place your faith in him and follow him? We talked about that briefly in our uh, new members class this morning. Jesus says, follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me, which insinuates movement. So many times we just want to stay where we are and say, God, bless me. He says, mm -mm, you move. You come with me. We have places to go, things to see, people to talk to. You come with me, I'll make you fishers of men as you follow me. There's movement there. That's what he expects. This week, uh, the 17th is what day this week? Uh, what's going on? Friday. Friday, and that's what? St. Patrick. Patrick's Day, okay? Mm -hmm. The Englishman that we think is Irish. <laughs> and um, we're talking about faith today. I don't know how much you know about Patrick. This is one of the two books that he 
author himself. And this is one instance of faith, because a lot of times we think faith can only happen when things are going right. Okay? When all the everything lines up in life, it's easy to have faith. You know, money's in the bank, and health is good, family's great, relationships are wonderful, jobs secure. I got all kinds of faith. <laughs> Maybe not. Can faith be present when things are bad? Yes. Yes. You don't need faith if you have all the answers. Listen. Page, oh, you don't even know the page. Listen to what he says here. This says, in order to increase the range of his influence, Patrick, he ordained gospel ministers everywhere. It can, it can be assumed that Patrick trained these men before their ordination. But Patrick gives us no details unless a reference to the sons of kings accompanying him on his uh, evangelistic travels be an allusion to his disciple them. Ultimately, Patrick never loses sight of the fact that it was God's grace that lay behind each and every success of his mission. For I am very much God's debtor. This is what St. Patrick says. For I am very much God's debtor, he joyfully confesses, who gave me such great grace that many people were reborn in God through me. There was in fact nothing Patrick had by way of abilities that was not God's gift to him. His missionary labors were not without strong opposition from pagan forces in Ireland. In one section of his confession, he says, Daily I expect murder, fraud, or captivity. He mentions two distinct occasions of captivity, one for two months and the other for a fortnight. He also relates that he was in peril of death twelve times, though he gives no details of these, lest he bore the reader. St. Patrick, if, if you don't know anything about Patrick, he was English, he was taken captive to Ireland, where he was a slave. When he was free, he prayed and felt the Lord's moving, the Holy Spirit moving him to go back to Ireland and to minister and evangelize those who had held him captive. And his, the key to his success is faith. It wasn't the fact that his parents had money, which they did. It wasn't the fact that there was a, a long lineage here that he could say, you know who my family is. He attributed everything that was successful in his life spiritually to God. God was the one empowering him. God was the one enabling him to be where he was. God was the one that allowed him to be taken as a captive slave so that he could come back later and share the gospel with those and have the power to share that gospel that many other people would never have. They're thinking, why in the world is this man coming back and sharing this message of love to me? the way I treated him. He carried power and weight because of what God had allowed him to go through. Faith. Faith is the key. Faith is the victory. Paul ends this chapter in Romans by declaring to us that there is justification only through faith. It is not a pedigree. It is not in our past. It is not in our present. It is not in our behavior. It is not in our family, in our jobs, in our finances. It is not in how long we have served, the home of Baptist Church or any other congregation. It is in faith in Jesus Christ. Does that mean you're going to have all the answers? You're going to understand everything? Mm -hmm. Faith is about trusting Jesus. Trusting Jesus. Well, sometimes I don't know where He's leading me. Sometimes I don't see how that's possible because what he's asking me to do is going to cost more than I have. Sometimes he may be leading me in a way that I'm going to lose my health if I do this. But do you trust him? Do you trust him? Do I trust him? We are justified by faith. By faith, not by words. I think I could preach this message 52 weeks out of the year and still have somebody to come up and argue the point because there is always people in the congregation that have spent their whole lives striving to make up for the past. They've spent their whole lives trying to reach some kind of magical number to where now I feel like I'm good with God. And when they hear this message, they say it can't be based on faith alone. It's got to be merit and faith. No, it's faith alone. Merit comes out of that faith. It has to be based on faith. Faith alone.
You know what your name is? Do you have to have a name tag to remember your name? <laughs> now the older we get, that might be a possibility. <laughs> when you go to the hospital these days, you go through the, the gates of the hospital, and you walk in and you take the test and put the mask, and wash your hands, whatever is required at that time, because it changes from day to day. You walk up to the desk and you say, where are you going? I'm going to the room, da 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 Who are you going to go see? da 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 Okay. And they ask for your ID. And they print it out. And they give you a stick. And you stick it right here. It tells them your name and that I'm a visitor. You have been given a badge. An identity. So that when you walk down the hallway and the doctors and the nurses and all those walking down the hallway are looking at you like you look kind of strange. They look at your identity and they say, oh, you belong here. God's given you an identity. You may look a little strange. You may act a little strange. People may look at you like you don't fit the bill of a Christian. You, something's wrong with you. You haven't grown up in church your whole life. You don't, you don't know all these scriptures. You don't know backwards and forwards and forwards. And you haven't memorized enough verses. The Lord gave me a, a badge, an identity in Jesus Christ. He says who I am. It's based on faith, folks. We are justified by faith. Faith in one. Period. Period. Where's the boasting? Kicked out the front door. That's where it is. It's gone. Excluded. There's no basis for boasting because it's not about us. It's about Jesus and what He's done. We just place our faith and trust in Him. Do you trust Him today? Do you trust Him? Are you following Him? I always say this until recently on Wednesday night. Brother Ben Pierce, who we've been listening to, said he always hears that the safest place to be is in the will of God. He says, that's nonsense. And when I heard it, I thought, wait a minute, you messed me up. Because I always say that. His point is that in the will of God, there's some danger. A lot of times there's danger, and he's absolutely right. When I say the best place to be is in the will of God, I know I'd, I'd rather face danger in the will of God than danger outside the will of God. That's my point. But he's right, folks, that you can be in the will of God in the middle of the center of his will and still be in danger because sometimes he allows things to happen so that he can use us to further the gospel. There's tons of examples in Scripture of people that were in the center of God's will. They got thrown the lion's den and the fire. And all kinds of things happened to them. They were running from a queen named Jezebel and hiding in caves. They were in God's will. They were scared sometimes. They were depressed sometimes. But God was with them. And in the center of God's will is the best place to be. I'll put it that way. It's the best place to be. How can you be in the center of God's will? You follow Him by faith. You trust Him by faith. Say, God, well, I need all the details first. Mm -hmm. That's not faith. By faith. And faith alone. We're going to sing this song as we close today. I want us to sing it together and understand the words. As we sing, the greatest thing in all my life is serving Him. Is loving Him. Trusting Him. That's the greatest thing you and I will ever have the opportunity to do. Is to bow down before our Lord every day as, as we find here in Romans in the 12th chapter. Every day we climb up on that altar and we present ourselves as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God. That's the greatest thing in our lives to have the opportunity to bow down before our King and worship Him every day in our lives. What we say and do. How we live our lives. So let's stand and sing the greatest thing. <laughs>
to the Lord that he will become your Lord and your Savior and that if he already is, that it will become more important that we walk by faith, we trust him. And the greatest thing in our lives is knowing and loving and serving God. There's nothing greater for us. Spend just a moment in prayer as she continues to pray. Father, thank you for loving us so much, so much. You provide the standard. It's not our works. It's, it's nothing that we can come up with. It's Jesus. He's the standard. So many times we compare ourselves to other people and we think I'm better than they are. And I haven't done that. And I haven't said that. And that's kind of how we feel better about ourselves. But Father, the truth is Jesus is perfect. And He's the standard. We'll never meet that standard. The good news is that we have a relationship with you through Jesus. Through who He is. Through what He's done. We're justified by faith. Father, grow us in our faith and our trust. Sometimes we have more faith in our government or in our doctor or in our family, in our family than we have in you. That ought not be. Help us to trust you, to follow you, and have faith in you. Period. We're justified by faith. Lord, I ask you now to be with these folks. We have guests with us, and members, and those that have been attending for a while. And Lord, I pray that you would just pour out your presence in their lives as they leave this building and this property. May they feel your presence, go with them wherever they are, and, and may we understand as brothers and sisters in Christ that ministry begins, service begins as we leave this building. There are many people that we will encounter this week that are lost, headed to a devil's hill, and they need to hear the gospel. They need to see it in our lives, and they need to see a people who rely on the Lord, who has given them everything they need, and they believe Him by faith. They trust Him by faith. May the world see that in us, Lord. And Father, now I ask you, please bless these folks. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace in Jesus' name.